Thank you. Thank you very much. So I am a futurist, and that means I travel all around the world. I give talks about the future, and I write a lot about it. And I'm known as the guy who said we've left the information age and entered the shift age. That's what people know me for, is having coined that phrase, the shift age. And basically, I coined that phrase 11 years ago because I knew that we, humanity, would be entering a time of great transformation and huge shift. And as a futurist, I'm here today to tell you that we are entering a historic convergence of art, design, and technology. Now, I'm often asked, how'd you become a futurist? And the long-winded answer to that includes the statement that I got my degree in art history a long time ago. And the reason I did, and the reason that affected me as a futurist, is because of the fact that art is the best insight to any culture or any society. And oftentimes, as you just heard about the futurists, futurism, art, projects into the future. Art always tells us where humanity is going. So what I'd like to do right now is take you on a quick, high-level, Western-oriented look as to how art and technology have intersected to bring us to this really significant convergence today. First of all, you heard in the Paleolithic Age was the beginning of art, 40,000 years ago. This was the art of the world and it painted the outside of the cave and on the inside. And this was the limited tools that they had. Tens of thousands of years later, the tools weren't that much greater, but these were the tools that were used by Michelangelo to create his great sculptures. And I intentionally picked the Boobily slaves because Michelangelo said, I don't create sculpture, I let the form emerge from the block of marble. So these boobily slaves show that greatly. And to think that he created all of this without limited technology is why he's the greatest sculptor in human history. Now the next piece of technology that impacted art, of course, was Gutenberg's movable type press in the mid 15th century. And it did a lot of things. The first thing it did is it disintermediated knowledge. It took knowledge out of the church and into the common man. It helped create the middle class 150 years later in Holland. Tens of thousands of copies of books were read in the two centuries after this. Hundreds of newspapers were born. So he disintermediated knowledge. He did end this beautiful art form called Illuminated Manuscript, but what he created was literature. We have Shakespeare because of this invention. So he created a whole new art form. The next significant technology, of course, was photography in the mid-19th century. This is about a circa 1860 camera, and of course this is a Monet painting. So it is not a coincidence that when photography came in, art was able to become less realistic. We no longer had to have painters painting what the world looked like because photography could do it better. So as the expressionists and impressionists said, we paint light. They didn't any longer have to paint things. That is a painting of light. And he was freed to do that. And all subsequent artists were free to go into abstract because of the invention of photography. The next great invention, of course, was recording. Recording of audio, the recording of the voice, the recording of the song, the recording of music. This famous image on the right, his master's voice, says it all. I think it's one of the most beautiful images about technology I've ever seen, a dog hearing his master's voice. The image on the left is Caruso, the greatest tenor in history. Of course, Pavarotti is now in that, in league with him. For the first half of his life, the only way you could hear his voice if you were in the room, and before that, of course, Mozart and Beethoven, the only way these great musicians could be heard was if you were in the physical space that they were in. In the second half of his life, starting in 1902, he recorded all of his great operas. So, the Pavarotti and the Caruso that we listen to today are as a result of this invention. First half of his life, 
You had to be in his presence. The second half of his life, and now 115 years later, we can hear him because we live in a spatial world where everything has been recorded and saved. Now, the picture on the left is a Cubist painting. And remember, art was released from having to depict reality. And so what art was now doing was depicting the consciousness and the frame and state of being that we were now feeling because we were living in the 20th century. And this painting was done at the same time that these inventions occurred. The industrialization of war, the internal combustion engine, the mechanization of flight. So we went from a rural mentality where things were calm and predictable and seasonal to very much of a fragmented consciousness, and that's what the Cubists were foretelling us of the 20th century. Now, art and design turned around and decided to face technology. The great industrial designer of the 20th century, Raymond Lowry, proudly stands in front of his locomotive. He designed this locomotive to connote the concept of speed and aerodynamicness. Prior to this, every single locomotion was just for function. It wasn't designed to look like anything. It was just a functional machine. Now design is creating technology. And 30 years later, he created the Avanti in 1964 for Studebaker, one of the most classic car designs ever. An industrial designer creates a car, not a car person. I know designers today who still drive this car. So now we have art and design creating how technology looks. Now, you know who this guy is, right? Andy Warhol. Two images, self-portraits. The significance of Andy Warhol is that he was one of the great futurists of the last century. We live in Andy Warhol's world. He coined the phrase, everybody in the future will be famous for 15 minutes. He coined the phrase, superstar. When he first painted, he painted Campbell's soup cans, and the art establishment was embracing uh, e abstract expressionism. That's not art, that's branding. Well, think about what you wear today. Everybody is branded. When I grew up, I didn't wear somebody's brand. I wasn't a walking advertisement. We're all walking advertisements now for brands. Also, what did he paint or silkscreen? Celebrities, Jackie O, Chairman Mao, Marilyn Monroe. So we live in a world of celebrities. This election is a celebrity election. And he also obviously created the selfie, right? So we live in Andy Warhol's world. He was a great futurist. Now, this is a oversimplification. In the 20th century was the left brain century, and the 21st century is the right brain century. Left brain, math, logic. Right brain, design, creativity, intuition. What did we do in the 20th century? It was science. We created the internal combustion engine and institutionalized it into transportation. We had the atom bomb, we had the computer. We paved the planet. In the 21st century, it is all about design and redesign and creativity. If you think about the word innovation, what precedes innovation is creative thought and creative design. So innovation is nothing but the introduction of design and creativity into the workplace. That's why I'm the futurist in residence at the Ringling College of Art and Design, because we live in the golden age of design. Everything has to be designed or redesigned. I'll talk about that more in a minute. There we go, okay? He is the most influential artist of the 21st century, Banksy. That's how he's known it. Most people don't know his real name. I don't. But what did he do? He took images and created dissonance about the world. A Molotov cocktail thrower throwing a bouquet of flowers. It creates dissonance. But significantly, it is where he does his work. I remember when all of this was trees. So he has taken art out of the museum, out of the galleries, and put it in the place where the commentary is real, and it forces us to face the reality of the place where we live. And where do we live? We live here, this spaceship Earth. Now, art helped me become a futurist, but there are two of the greatest futurists of the last 60 years which really shaped my thinking. Our book, Mr. Fuller and Marshall McLuhan. 
In the late 60s, R. Buckminster Fuller wrote a book, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, and he said, we've been given this great spaceship on which to live, and we don't have an operating manual, and we have to develop one. But of course, being left brain 20th century, we didn't. We kept creating more technology, and we forgot about it. A year after he wrote that book, Marshall McLuhan said, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We are all crew. Which I thought was a great metaphor for where we live. We're crewing this planet. Now, Fuller, in 1969, said, in several decades, humanity will approach a fork in the road, utopia or oblivion. I think we may already be past that fork in the road towards oblivion. This is the name of my most recent book that I co-authored with Tim Robbins, a planetary ethicist at Ringling. In the two years it took to research this book, it became clear to me that climate change is oblivion, that climate change can end civilization by the end of the 21st century. So think about this image. Think about a spaceship. A spaceship always gets resupplied. Who's going to resupply spaceship Earth? We've got at least five generations before we can colonize Mars. So for five generations, this is our home. We live on spaceship Earth. Think about a spaceship. It's got a defined crew and a finite amount of resources. And if you live beyond those resources, you're going to have to abort the mission. Since 1970, we've been operating at more than one Earth's worth of resources per year. We are at now 1.6 Earth resources per year. And if you live the American way of life, in the world were to, if everybody, we'd have to have five planets to sustain this. So we're already in the red zone by 60%. So how do we do this? Well, at the center of climate change and fighting it is design. We have to redesign how we live. We have to redesign a consumer culture from being materialistic to being experiential. We need to redesign education. We need to redesign technology, transportation, energy. So it is the designers of the world that are going to help us. And to do what we've all heard we've been encouraged to do, be the change you believe in in the world. As a futurist, I've set up, I've co-founded a nonprofit foundation based here in Sarasota called thisspaceshipearth.org. And the reason we have created this is because of one goal only. We want to create crew consciousness on the planet. We want to design a way that we can all live as crew members. And our goal is very simple. There's 7.4 billion of us on the planet. We, thespaceshipearth.org, wants to recruit 1 billion crew members. So I hope that the few hundred people that are here today will all become crew members and help us redesign the only place we have to live. Thank you.